Hello everyone and welcome to this next episode in our podcast series, Getting to Better Together, which is sponsored by the Centre for International Development, Social Entrepreneurship and Leadership, known as SIDSL. It's within the University of the Sunshine Coast and I am your host, Richard Borden. Before proceeding any further, I wish to acknowledge the original custodians of this land, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And with this acknowledgement comes a profound appreciation of the nature and significance of differences in cultural beliefs and value assumptions between different peoples. For me, it's a matter of considerable concern and in deep regret that such appreciation of cultural distinctions remains characteristically less than widespread, particularly in our so-called Western culture. Perhaps I should say Western monoculture. We seem to be unwilling to understand such distinctions in beliefs and assumptions, let alone open ourselves to advantages that they may well present to us. Paradoxically, the domination in Australia here, for instance, of what we might call the prevailing Western worldview, has essentially suppressed a number of characteristics of the cultures of Aboriginal Australians, for example, that would prove vital in our quest for getting to better together under the new circumstances that we now face. As I have emphasised in previous episodes in this series, our focus on the exploitation of land rather than custodianship of it has resulted in severe disturbances of our natural environment and the scale of these impacts is such that it's now vital and urgent in our quest for betterment, which leads us to nothing less than a major transformation of our cultural worldviews, which means not just our own views of the world, but those of the culture in which we are embedded. The same can be said, I would argue, for the need for our rejection of individualism, of the me, my, mine variety, in favour of the emphasis on collectivism, community collaboration, uh, that was, as it remains, typical of many traditional cultural groups. An emphasis on materialism, on gross domestic product, as a measure of our progress or our well-being, Uh, the commodification of everything, including houses, seems a very one-eyed view of the world, when the challenges that we face are far, far more than one-eyed. All of this has come into stark relief for me over the past few months through my engagement with colleagues from six different universities in Papua New Guinea in a collaborative project exploring the leadership role of universities in the strategic development of that entire nation into a future that will, at the very least, be as turbulent as the one it is currently living through. And frankly, this needs to be done with an acute awareness of the potential for the loss, through westernisation, of the enormously diverse cultural strengths and advantages of several thousand traditional cultural groups in that country, speaking more than 800 different languages. It's therefore my great privilege this morning to talk of these challenges with one of our Papua New Guinea project colleagues who's rising to these challenges with a keen awareness of their magnitude as well as of their nature. Dr. Jennifer Litau is the Academic Quality Assurance Manager at the Pacific Adventist University in Barocco, which is some 20 kilometres or so outside Port Moresby. Good morning, Jennifer, and welcome to the podcast. Good morning, Professor Richard Borden. And thank you for inviting me to join this podcast. It is our pleasure. Let me start our conversation by asking you to capture for us your take on the turbulence in which your your country currently finds itself. What's happening, in other words, that wasn't happening, say, three years ago? At this present time, we are in... um, caught in an epidemic of um, another wave of COVID-19 and uh, and the challenges that um, it is presenting now are enormous to the system's capacity and also um, health workers and um, and just the general public because as you uh, might have already known PNG is uh, is still very much a uh, subsistence economy 80% 80% of the people still dwell you know so to speak rural spaces and um, you know the rural um, parts of um, of this country a little less than that uh, urbanites so um, 
you know, the challenges with uh, communication, for example, Ill illiteracy is still a problem in many rural areas. Communications about, um, you know, uh, observing COVID protocols, masking, social distancing, personal hygiene, and all of that are a real, real problem at this present um, time. Um, so that's one area. And then just just the sheer, you know, uh, challenges that, you know, the absence of a national national uh, network of transportation, communication, uh, presents to people who live in rural areas to access uh, much needed um, medical and health care at this present time, even accessing um, vaccination. As a country, of course, you have many endemic diseases because you're tropical. So issues like malaria uh, are endemic. So are people accustomed to what's turned into a pandemic, but to them, of course, is still an epidemic? So is there a sort of sense of people saying, well, this is really not much different from anything else and we can just live through it? Yes, there is that sense uh, in, a, in a public, um, you know, public sentiments you just uh, reflected upon there. And, um, and people are saying, it's, uh, you know, we've had uh, flu all the time and um, all you need to do is turn to herbs and turn to steaming and, uh, and you should be fine. Except that this wave is a much more deadlier wave than the previous um, few waves that we have experienced. On the one hand, I guess the advantage, uh, there is an advantage in the fact that um, there is so much isolation of, of communities within Papua New Guinea, uh, and so the spread of the pandemic might be slower than it would otherwise. Is that so? Yes, that would be so, because many people probably, you know, not, this is for want of a better word, but maybe trapped in, you know, islands and in remote places of the country um, are still not in contact with the world and, you know, with any possibility of infection. All these uh, COVID um, restrictions and protocol are probably not as meaningful to them. Right. But having said that, uh, most provincial governments and the national government, and even in institutions now, that there, there is a, uh, a push for vaccination. Yeah, so it, because of the, uh, the lack of capacity in, in the health system to deal with any, any major epidemic within the country. What would you argue that the, uh, th this particular situation then is having on the universities. There are, as I understand it, seven universities in Papua New Guinea? Yes, there is. And um, look, the, I, just, I just learned the other day the University of Papua New Guinea um, is considering uh, closing down because in Port Moresby, infections have, um, are, are picking up. And um, you know, it will be interesting what the reactions are. I, I understand that um, the uh, Western Pacific University is in isolation. Um, University of Goroka has been severely affected because, um, because of a mini show they had in the university a few weeks ago. And a few, a few of their, um, their people and um, a couple of academics probably have passed. But uh, So they're in lockdown as well with the entire Eastern Highlands. Uh, no um, travels wow. by uh, public uh, transport and also um, via airlines. And a few other provinces are co considering um, shutting down. So um, that is challenging us, particularly with regards to the safety of students and also as to how we're able to manage learning. And Pacific Adventist University has gone uh, completely online now until the end of this month and to assess what, what might be um, the way forward again. But um, we're all challenged in ways that we probably had not envisaged at the, uh, at the beginning of the year and to have made probably better plans um, going forward in, in how we manage teaching and learning and the, well, the welfare and the well-being of students. Wow, that's a really, really serious situation, isn't it? Does your university and the other universities uh, in Papua New Guinea have a history of, of remote learning? Probably not really. Not really, be, because, you know, we've always, we, we inherited 
a an education system that that uh, that is so institutionally uh, based and biased that um, we've not really thought of remote learning and that sort of a thing in the past. Although University of Papua New Guinea is. Um, has operated um, a number of open campuses around the country, uh, which pretty much offer matriculation um, for year 12 and then a pathway to university uh, for low performing uh, year 12 students. And the Department of Education offers the um, distance, uh, sorry, the FOD, which, which is a program designed to assist uh, grade 12 school leavers to upgrade their poor results and um, take another chance at applying to university. So, and then many, many universities now, a number of universities, Divine Word, for example, has amalgamated several campuses around the country, and they appear to be operating the largest, um, offering the largest uh, education um, program to the country now because of their several amalgamated campuses around the country, and Pacific Adventist University too has affiliated programs. But um, that would be, up to this point, that has been, you know, the norm. We think, okay, open up an amalgamated campus, open up an affiliated program, I mean, establish one, and um, establish an open campus. So that's always been the norm in our thinking of introducing remote learning in this country. One of the things I have always um, grasped about, about Papua New Guinea and its extraordinary diversity in terms of the different cultures and languages and so on is the fact that there is an inherent sense of collaboration right through to the duties and obligations of the Wontok system. Could, could you explain that to the listeners? What does, what does Wontok mean and, and how is it? in terms of its collaboration? That's an interesting question, and it's something um, something we need to talk about in this country because we pretend, we pretend we uh, when we talk about development, when we talk about um, our formal programs um, in education in any of the other other development sectors, that we always be talking from assumptions, from assumptions that we are a fully. Um, transitioned economy to, you know, a, mo um, a cash or a modernized or an industrial industrial economy in the sense of Rostos, you know, stages of development. Okay, we appear to be, I mean, if you look at the entire spectrum of development in this country, it appears to be progressing at different, st different stages, not in a linear fashion, but at different stages along um, along the Rostos, you know, uh, stages of growth theory. But it's not the progress is not sustainable. It's not consistent. It's irregular in some parts of the country, particularly rural areas and remote places that they actually cut off. And that where the connections and the linkages in economy seem to be more dynamic in the informal sector, which we can, you know, we can position, situate between uh, the fully, um, you know, cash uh, sector of the society and the subsistent, fully subsistent sector. So it seems that a lot of things are happening in the informal sector, but. All of that is being driven by the Wantok system. You know, the PNG census, the PNG census is a question about how many people live in your house. And they have all these um, answers, you know, father, mother, bro son, daughter, uncle, aunt, grandmother, grandfather. Uh -huh. And so all of this. One talk means same language speaker, but it doesn't really mean that it's used in a relative sense. So one talk can mean uh, your extended family members. It can mean also people you, uh, you consider some affinity with because you have social relationships with, like people you go to church with. 
members of your clan, your tribe, members of your village, your island, your province. And, uh, and so it, it's, um, it's used in a fluid uh, context with no boundaries, no social boundaries. And the way it works is, um, is that many de- in many development literature on PNG, the Wantak system has been, has been hailed as a buffer for, uh, against absolute poverty because it captures all these people who may be falling through the cracks of development but who are still provided for. So, for example, when I was attending um, high school, um, my dad was a subsistence farmer, so he couldn't afford to pay all the fees I needed. So my uncles, my mother's brothers, a couple of them supported me, but one took over and paid for most of my high school education. And, um, and so I have an obligation, you know, in this one-talk system sense that to support that uncle, not just my parents, not just my immediate family. And so, you know, in every sense of the word support, you know, when he, when he has been in need of cash, to give cash, to support his kids, right. even get an education. So it's reciprocal. The Wantak system works on the principle of reciprocity. Right. And, and that, is, that is an amazing uh, thing because even in PNG, we do not have aged care facilities, for example. The uh, children and grandchildren are obliged to take care of their old and the sick as well, are supported and cared for in that manner. And, um, well, it's not just about well-being. It's a, a sorry welfare um, deeper into um, the the essence of the way one talk system works is well being the uh, impact for well being. That is really fascinating, isn't it? Because th- there's nothing uh, in so called Western society that even shadows that. I mean, it's it's a commitment, a, a reciprocal one, as you say. Uh, so it's collaboration, but there is a, an element of reciprocity. So it, there is um, a responsibility to collaborate, an obligation, if you That's will. That's right. That is right. I mean, in the context of COVID, for example, and where someone has to be isolated, someone is in quarantine, well, they're not, they're not alone. The, the one talks, the extended family members uh, will check on that, uh, check on them, will make sure they are provided for, will even, uh, they even risk, you know, ch- uh, physically uh, checking on them. So, I mean, that's one of the concerns about COVID as well, that uh, the one talk system um, will just defeat, you know, all the protection we can, um, we can take for ourselves and for others around us. Right. Right. I mean, that is something, of course, that um, societies like like this one here in Australia could learn from really profoundly in terms of the way people do collaborate and where the network fails in terms of the formal institutions, then the informal ones are there. Does the Wontuck system have an impact on people going to universities? Do they recognize that Going to university would be a responsible thing to do as far as the Wontok relationships are concerned? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And and when, um, you know, for example, every year over 30,000 uh, grade 12 uh, students pass out and about 30% of them will get into university because of, you know, the, the mere availability of spaces in each of the universities in this country. They, they do not take any more than you know, beyond 5,000 or something. So because of that, a lot of families in one talks of those families and the kids who have passed out will feel this burden to do something extra, for, you know, to give extra support. And um, depending on where people live, they will front up at university reception desks and say, look, I have, I have a niece, I have a nephew, I have a one talk um, who's got good marks, couldn't get a 
space at university. Would you be able to um, check if there is a space? They're interested in this program. Could you offer them a, a space? So this dialogue is going on all the time. Every at the end, at the beginning of semesters, and uh, every semester and every year. You know, it's a regular thing. Sometimes it's a nuisance. You know, to universities and university um, um, staff who deal with this sort of thing. But um, that's the way it works. And they will even pay, even at the last call and request, pay for fees, and support kids uh, whose parents are not able to support them. One talks will, a clans, a clans people will, their tribes, men and women will. Mm, interesting stuff, it's true. Is there a danger that that will be lost in terms of the, the development that's occurred elsewhere, which of course under the, the present system in many countries has proved to be limiting? So if we leap from COVID into climate change, for instance, countries where the notion of getting to better doesn't seem to include the fact that we really need to address major issues like climate change, and then in particular, the togetherness bit, which we, um, again, generally speaking, have lost sight of, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the introduction, that this is now very much an individualistic society compared to everything you have just described, which is profoundly collaborative, profoundly together. Is there a, a chance that this might well be lost? Look, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting, um, interesting uh, scenario, you know, to try to unpack uh, this whole thing. But it is true that, you know, getting together to betterment and, uh, you know, for... For uh, for mutual um, betterment is is very important, and um, already we we detect in urban spaces that um, this one talk system is disappearing, and because you have what ha what happens in reality is that employed employed one talks or one talks that are on a salary or a wage seem to take uh, bear much of the responsibility for supporting um, others right. and particularly those of um, those uh, those of rural areas those of their one talks in rural areas and so it can be it can become such a financial burden and put financial stress on them and particularly in PNG where most services are still use, you know, under user pay policy. Um, people have to pay to access in health, in education, and um, there's some level of subsid subsidizing by the state, but there is not enough for a lot of rural people who are pretty much subs subsistence um, based and cannot afford because they do not have a regular income. So that burden falls upon career people, employed people, and they, you know, some of them, some of them, because of that weight of extra responsibility, financial responsibility, that, um, you know, we know of instances where some do not want to honor that, some in, uh, particularly university graduates, because a lot of that responsibility falls upon them. The elite and those who have good right. good career, good salaries, yeah. So, so there'll come a time where you know. I mean, maybe the time is not too too soon, but um, that's the trend. Where if this country continues to change and transform into a um, cash, you know, fully cash economy, it'll, there'll come a time when okay, so people may be able to take care of themselves then. But um, that, you know, the values, the values that uh, underpin the one tax system will dissipate. Jennifer, that's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, I would love to talk much, much further about the role that universities may well have to play in this maintaining this balance between cultural strengths of what uh, has existed for thousands of years through to what happens if one goes fully to a cash economy. So I would hope that I can come back to you at some stage uh, in the near future and talk further about what you believe the role of universities should be in this development process uh, and how it can 
deal with this synthesis of the of the traditional with the so-called modern. So thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And thank you to all our listeners for um, contributing to the debates and the discussions around this theme we regard as so primal, so of such importance, getting to better together. So until next time, this is your host Richard Borning signing off and looking forward to catching up with you again soon.